Hello. Welcome to the webinar. This is Arvind Goel, Chairman of IWAMA Association. I see there are a large number of registrations, and uh, I have been advised that members or attendees may take a few seconds to fine tune their connection. So uh, we will give another uh, a minute or so before we formally launch this webinar. So we just wait for a few seconds and then we go live. So those who are logging in now, please wait for a few seconds or maybe half a minute or so, and then we will start the webinar. Uh, all of us want to learn a lot in this webinar, and uh, we would like to make the most use of this time. So we should be starting very, very shortly. Just have a little bit of patience and then we'll be live. Good afternoon, friends and colleagues from the valve and actuator industry. This is Arvind Goel. You don't see me. That's why I'm introducing myself. I am the chairman of IWAMA Association, which represents the valve and actuator manufacturers in India. This is the second webinar, which is being arranged by our association. And this webinar is being arranged because in our board meeting and after that in the open discussion with all the founding members, there was a specific request that there should be a webinar on the subject of contractual obligations and force measure clause. Of course, all of us get orders from public sector units from government organizations or international customers. And all these orders and contracts invariably will have a force measure clause in fine print. But I don't think that many of us have really gone through that clause or certainly not in depth. But today, when we face an unusual situation of pandemic, all of us are going back to these orders and trying to see what kind of clause is there. Can our customer cancel the order without any recourse to us? Or can they just defer the supplies? Or can we make use of force measure clause to get back to customer and tell them that you cannot charge LD or liquidated damages on the supplies which were delayed on account of uh, uh, various factors uh, affecting the supply chain and lockdown. So this becomes very important for us. And uh, then we try to see that how we go about. Uh, my uh, uh, friend Sumit Sharma of indo German Chamber of Commerce uh, then strongly recommended ASA and Associates for organizing this and connected me with Kim Kalako. And uh, thanks to their efforts, today we have this webinar arranged. We have an eminent panel of 
uh, specialists who would share their uh, advice with us. Uh, but let me caution here that force major clauses can be different in different contracts and what is being talked today will not necessarily be applicable to uh, all the contracts for that you may need to get a specific legal advice so to introduce the speakers uh, we have mr himanshu srivastava who is from asn associates which is a 30 year old accounting and consulting firm with over 700 professionals which are spread over eight offices in india uh, they focus on foreign companies setting up their operations in india and they are one of the foremost accounting and consulting firms assisting clients in setting up their businesses mna partner search and many other things mr himanshu srivastava heads the business advisory services vertical of asn associates and leads the japan desk his responsibilities include end-to-end -end business strategy and project management directed at facilitating foreign investments in india and assisting foreign companies to set up and operate in india the legal advice will come from dsk legal which is a firm which was set up in 2001 uh, they have their offices in mumbai delhi bangalore and pune uh, they have a host of international and uh, domestic clients and uh, provide assistance in corporate and commercial laws competition law antitrust employment news etc etc uh, mr anand desai who is from dsk legal is the managing partner he is one of the leading practitioners in india having 30 years of domestic and international experience he is a trusted counsel to several large multinational indian corporates and high net worth individuals uh, the second panelist from dsk legal is mr aparajit bhattacharya who focuses on corporate commercial mna private equity and venture capital he is also part of project practice with a keen focus on environment health and safety measures uh, today's webinar uh, would be uh, in the format of presentations by the three experts in the beginning after that there will be a q a which will be moderated by uh, mr Bhuganandam, and then there will be closing remarks by Pranagar. so i think we all look forward to looking forward to this uh, webinar and now i request mr himanshu Srivastava to go ahead with this presentation uh, uh, thank you very much. I thank Mr. Irwin Joel of IVAMA and other members of IVAMA uh, and all my regards to the all guests and my fellow speakers. So before I really start uh, and you know uh, build up to the you know recent amendments, uh, considering that we have received a lot of queries on force major issues, uh, let me assure the audience that we have factored uh, ample of time to address this issue and also to have the Q and A in the end but uh, uh, you know so we thought that in order to have very comprehensive uh, overview of the situation we built up a scheme of presentation i will my presentation will primarily focus on <clears throat> you know certain recent uh, policy changes as we all know uh, next uh, may i request uh, you know the, yes so uh, you know as we all know due to global outbreak of coronavirus uh, an unprecedented event. The ongoing lockdown has led to an atmosphere of severe uncertainty and challenges. Uh, in order to control the spread, government has ordered all non-essential establishments to temporarily close uh, physical offices and mostly companies are now working remotely. Keeping in mind the prevailing situation, government has temporarily relaxed a number of compliances in the various late corporate laws. Uh, we analyzed some of the major relaxation from companies law, foreign exchange law, and other key regulations. Uh, my fellow speakers, uh, you know, from DSK would also be speaking legal aspects of contractual issues. So next slide, please. So this is primarily a very key amendment in foreign direct investment. Uh, you know, as you all may be aware, non-resident entities can invest in India freely in most of the sectors and activities subject to FDI policies. There are certain exceptions such as lottery, atomic energy, railways, 
you know these are prohibited activities however the government has now introduced a new rule called press note 3 of uh, 2020 on april 17th which made prior government clearances mandatory for any investment which is coming from countries that share land borders with india so we all know you know primarily the countries such as china pakistan bangladesh nepal myanmar and bhutan and afghanistan which i have you know written down in front of me so let us say for take an example say china you know so if any entity is based out of china or beneficial owner of such investment into india is situated say in china or is citizen of china such entity can invest in india only after approving prior approval from india henceforth to explain in more simple words if the parent company outside India say is based in Netherlands as a subsidiary or joint venture in India and such parent company Netherlands receives any investment from either an entity based in China or from a Chinese citizen such transaction would amount to an indirect investment in India and hence by virtue of this press note will require an approval from government of India so it is very, it's very pertinent to note here that as to what constitute beneficial ownership has not been defined and I think much of the pain is because of that. So I believe that it will be applicable to all multi-layer transactions as well. If there is any Chinese investment at any level, therefore uh, FDI in unlisted securities which are outside the purview of foreign portfolio investments regulation, I, in my view, will also get impacted uh, with this notification, especially on investment from China and. Hence, such investors would also need prior approval before they make any investment. So, I, I believe government would surely scrutinize such cases in detail, and we are reading it in media every day. However, it's not clear how and how much time it would take, but it would be advisable. Um, my view is that if the government puts in place an efficient approval mechanism, which would help bring certainty for investments. Also, the government should come out with some clarification regarding the beneficial ownership norms. And if possible, some relaxation in new manufacturing sector, uh, new investments uh, under the Make in India policy. Next. The next two slides, uh, please. Next one, I've covered it. Next. Yeah. The next two slides on, are primarily on relaxation board meetings and shareholder meetings. I'll just quickly cover it. Uh, as you all may be knowing it, that a company is required to hold four board meetings every financial year with a gap of not more than 120 days between two consecutive board meetings. And there are restrictions on certain agenda items which cannot be held through audiovisual means for board meetings. So the Ministry of Corporate Affairs has relaxed certain corporate compliances such as holding board meetings and has exempted physical presence of directors for approval of, amongst many other things, even annual financial statement or board report, etc. also. So consequently, such meetings can now be held through video conferencing. Uh, you know, uh, for the quarter ended uh, June 30th, whatever was scheduled can be now held through the uh, board meetings. Similarly, next, go to next slide, please. Similarly, all companies are required to hold their annual general meetings within six months, as we all know. So the companies whose uh, financial year ended on December 3rd, 31st, 2019 can has been relaxed to hold their board meeting by September 30th, as well as all other companies have now been permitted to hold their annual general meetings through audiovisual means. Mind it, it was not allowed to hold the AGM through audiovisual means. Therefore, due to ongoing lockdown, the ministry has permitted annual general meetings as well as extraordinary general meetings to be conducted through video conferencing or any other audio audiovisual mode. I, I believe this would really facilitate a lot of subsidiaries of foreign companies as I know a lot of participants, you know, have such a issue, may have such an issue. Next slide, please. Then I'm really going to be talking a uh, you know, key invest key amendment in insolvency and bankruptcy code. Uh, briefly, it's written there, but uh, you know, uh, before this amendment, the section four of IBC insolvency bankruptcy code stated that eligibility to file any application under the code was a minimum default of rupees hundred thousand, implying in case that company defaults in repayment of any debt on account of uh, supply of material service. The creditor with as low as rupees uh, 100,000 or US dollar 1300 could sue the company, leading to either repayment or takeover or even liquidation of the company sometimes. So the threshold led to uh, you know deluge of uh, application and wasted a lot of time of the authorities as well as a lot of operational creditors tried you know to uh, 
extract uh, uh, you know you know avenge uh, their delays in payment and this led to a very dispro disproportionate power in hands of traders so the, therefore the government has now raised the minimum default threshold to its maximum capacity which is rupees 1 crore or 10 million rupee so the i believe the motive behind this change was primarily to provide the relief to industry uh, which would otherwise face deep financial difficulties in uh, meeting the obligation during this crisis and second also to safeguard the interests of uh, medium small micro enterprises sector so yesterday the prime minister spoke about making india self reliant and announced uh, an atmanirbhar economic package with focuses on land liquidity labor and law so after this webinar i would encourage you all to watch the finance minister nirmala sitharaman sharing details of how and what this uh, 20 lakh crore economic stimulus package would really mean next slide please uh, the ministry of commerce and industries also in view of this covid 19 uh, has decided to continue uh, release under various export promotion scheme by granting extension of the existing foreign trade policy by another one year that is until up to uh, 31st march 2021 and all the benefits which are enumerated on the slides such as uh, you know various export promotion scheme or validity period of certificates or filing you know uh, due dates of filing various applications or reports in turn have been extended accordingly next slide so prominently, you know, amongst these four regulations, which you all probably, you know, are maybe aware, I would say that first two, which is additional time frame of six months, which has been granted to newly incorporated companies to file declaration of commencement of business in existing to existing period of six months is a welcome uh, change. Uh, we are handling a lot of new setups, so it's it's a breather to us as well as to our clients, and also the you know for the financial year 1920, I believe a lot of uh, non a uh, lot of expatriates who were staying uh, in india and had to leave because of this covid outbreak uh, you know non compliance of minimum residency in india for a period of 1 to days uh, would would kind now probably would get uh, uh, not be treated as a non compliant so this is a welcome change and then of course there are certain uh, relaxation as you can all see next uh, corporate social responsibility so the ministry of corporate affairs has also clarified that spending of CSR fund for COVID-19 and making contribution to PMKS fund uh, is an eligible CSR activity. The CSR fund may be spent for various activities related to COVID-19, such as related to promotion of healthcare, including preventive healthcare, sanitation, disaster management. Well, while my fellow speaker would deliberate in detail, in my view, Payment of salary wages to employees and workers in normal circumstances, the contractual and statutory obligation of the company. Similarly, payment of wages to temporary or casual or even daily wage worker during the lockdown is part of contractual or moral or humanitarian obligation and hence is applicable to all companies irrespective of whether they have any legal obligation to do CSR. Therefore, uh, payment of salary wages to employees and workers or to temporary or casual or daily workers during the lockdown period shall not be counted towards CSR expenditure. However, if any extra share payment is made to temporary casual workers over and above the disbursement of wages specifically for the purpose of fighting COVID-19, uh, the same shall be admissible towards CSR expenditure as a one-time exception. So the management of the company must uh, have to make a de de declaration, uh, which is a, you know, a certification by statutory auditor, has to be certified by them stating that the payment is the nature of extra share. So this is primarily take care of blue collar worker during these difficult times. I'm sure everyone is doing it. So next slide, please. There are certain specialized, uh, you know, lending institutions such as NABARD, National Housing Board or SIDBI, who've been provided a liquidity facility of 50,000 crore or INF 500 billion, huge amount, to enable lending to SME and housing sector. Now, these institutions play an important role to meet long-term funding requirements of uh, let's say rural sector agriculture small industries housing finance microfinance so the tightening of financial condition because of this ongoing uh, situation had made it very difficult for these institutions to raise resources from the market therefore now the banks have uh, you know been facilitating lending in these sector further banks have also allowed moratorium on existing loan as well as interest on loans also been deferred by three months 
and uh, the period of relax realization of export proceeds which you all know is a standard period of nine months from the date of export uh, this period uh, of realization and repatriation uh, which would be made uh, all these export made up to july 31st have been extended for 15 months from the date of export next slide please also uh, briefly to mention here we will see more in the at 4 pm when finance minister makes some announcement but to help support the efforts uh, and to address the COVID-19 emergencies, Small Industry Development Bank of India is supporting micro, small, medium enterprises, which are manufacturing product or providing services related to fighting the coronavirus with the various schemes, you know, such as uh, the SAFE scheme, which you see on the slide, or SAFE Plus scheme and SMILE scheme. Under these schemes, loans are being extended at a very low interest rate, say 5% and at very short turnaround time of 48 hours. So specifically, you know, SETB has also uh, floated another finance scheme for healthcare sector called SMILE, uh, which under which medium and long term loans are very attractive rates shall be provided for financing healthcare sector, which includes hospital, nursing home, clinics, etc. For their requirement, you know, related to fighting uh, coronavirus and creating necessary infrastructure. So with this, you know, I uh, I think I've summarized some key uh, 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 amendments. Now I would pass on uh, the baton to a very experienced uh, speaker, uh, Mr. Anand Desai. He's a very senior lawyer, and I would I, I would you know request Mr. Anand to take over from here. Over to you, Anand. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity. I know a lot of people are talking about how do they perform contracts, how do they make a payment when they're not earning, how will they bear the losses that are going to be thrust upon them because of what has happened. So I'm just going to give an outline very broadly. I'll try and cover the questions which I've received within this outline itself. My partner will then talk on certain specific issues and possibly elaborate on some of what I have said. And then we are happy to look at other questions if you have them. Number one, I talk about section 56 of the Contract Act, which is bandied around as an alternative for force major. It is not an alternative, first. It is a situation where a contract is entered into which it is impossible to perform at the time it is entered into or becomes impossible to perform. Now, when we say impossible to perform, merely because prices of goods have changed and therefore you are selling at a loss does not make it impossible. If, however, the entire situation has changed, let me give an example. You are making parts for an automobile that does not have the latest standards required by the government at a point of time. Yet orders have been placed upon you. The buyer may say, look, it is now impossible for me to buy these. I cannot use these anymore, as an example. It's a narrow one whether it will survive a test in court remains to be seen. But what is called economic or price impossibility is not considered impossibility. It has to be something more than that. And yet it need not be an absolute prohibition or absolute impossibility. So like the example I gave, there could be others as well. So if I'm supposed to be delivering goods into a country to which India goes to war, for example, and the government says, sorry, all movement of goods between these two countries has stopped. And I have a three month or 10 month window within which I have to deliver, failing which there's no need for those goods. Either it's a perishable, or the purpose is going to be achieved by that time. Those are situations of impossibility that flow from the statute itself. And there is case law on this as to what amounts to impossibility. The next is force major. Force major is a contractual term. Force major does not find place in any statute in India. So it is not a statutory remedy like impossibility or frustration which we discussed just now, it is purely a result of what has been negotiated between contracting parties and contained specifically in words in a manner that can be understood in a manner that expresses the intention of the two parties or more parties to a contract. 
it has to therefore be read as a contractual term. It is not a general term that can be raised and used between two parties. We have to look at each specific contract and see what the parties have agreed. Now, I do realize that most contracting parties in themselves do not spend much time reading these clauses, force major, notices, jurisdiction, arbitration. These are considered to be clauses generally that lawyers are supposed to be experienced at, equipped to put in, and therefore they normally put them in. And it is quite common for clients not even to read these. That's a fact. What they read are the key terms of the bargain or the commercial understanding that they have arrived at. So they ensure the price is right, the goods are properly described, delivery time is properly described, etc. Delays, interest, all that they normally do look at. These are clauses they don't look at, unfortunately. And I suspect now they will look at them more carefully, having been through this experience. The contract, therefore, when we actually look at it, may have specific exclusions or it may be an inclusive contract or inclusive draft so for example it can say the following acts will amount to force major floods epidemics etc etc for example in which case whatever you are claiming is preventing you from performing your obligations under the contract has to fall squarely within that description the other way to draft a clause is to say acts of God or acts beyond the control of the parties, including ABCD, whatever the ABCD may be. It is a little bit easier in that situation to spread a wider net as to what is to be covered if a party does resort to the force major clause. The second ingredient has to be that this event has occurred and by virtue of this event occurring, a party which is claiming the force major is not able to perform. So it must adversely affect the ability of the party to perform. So for example, in the lockdown situation we currently have, again, I'm giving a simple example. If you, had, if you have agreed to manufacture and deliver a batch of products within 30 days, because of the lockdown, you are unable to procure raw material. You are unable to possibly start your factory. You are unable to pack the goods. You are unable to deliver the goods. So the entire sequence of events makes it either impossible or Im effectively impossible for a short period. Sorry, the one more thing I should mention in section 56 is the kind of impossibility we are talking about puts an end to the contract. So the contract stands avoided or terminated. It is not a temporary suspension. Force major, on the other hand, typically is a temporary suspension. We have often seen force major clauses used in situations where there are floods, where there are some riots preventing people entering into an area because of law and order situation, a shortage caused by some kind of government diktat or order. Those are typical cases we see force major. We've also seen force major, for example, where the clause says, if there is union trouble, if there is unavailability of a raw material, like a steel or cement for the housing industry. But like I said, it has to be clear. It can be specific. It can be inclusive. It must have an adverse effect on your ability of the party claiming force major to perform. Another factor to keep in mind is typically, a force major clause is for a defined period. So it will typically say that you can claim force major for a period while the act or event which prevents you from performing subsists. And normally what you'll see is a further provision to say that if this continues, the force major condition continues or event continues beyond a certain period. And again, that's a negotiated term. It may be six months, nine months, one year. In that case, parties may terminate the contract. That is also something very typically seen in force major clauses, the way they are drafted. The next point is a party must actually claim that a force major event has occurred falling within the contract. Typically, a clause is providing for notice to be given. So when a party claims force major, 
he is obliged to give notice that this force major event under clause so and so has arisen he is also typically required to give an indication as to how long he thinks it will continue obviously it may continue longer or shorter and that he is therefore not obliged to perform during this time now one thing i must say because a lot of people ask this question that can force major also be a ground not to pay let me break this up into various components a lot of people are asking today about rental premises and my partner may speak a little more about this but let me touch upon it people say we are not able to access our office or our factory or our residence in some cases where people are outside the city so why should i pay rent now the problem with that argument is that while you may not be able to access it it is not as though you are not using it because your goods are lying there equipment may be lying there belongings are lying there it is not therefore lying vacant this is one example therefore to say i will not pay rent is not something that's practical because the consideration for the rent is the use of the premises not necessarily access it is rare and i have seen a couple of agreements which also say if i cannot access physically my premises i don't need to pay the force major event that's great if you have a clause of that kind but that is unusual if for example you have a bank loan because you are not earning money is not a ground not to pay the bank what would be a ground if you are unable to pay the bank for example if i know there's a couple of cases where banks like pmc bank suddenly were effectively shut down people have tried to say look the government has stopped me or rbi has stopped me taking out more than 5 lakhs i have no other money that could be a talking point again it depends upon the way the wording is but typically like i said paying money is not an obligation that is prevented by a situation like an epidemic or a lockdown because there is no physical movement you can do an nft transfer etc and thereby you can get the money transferred to the payee again in a force major situation you may give multiple notices as has been the case in the current situation because the situation has evolved initially there was an epidemic fear which became a lockdown partial relaxation in some parts of country essential goods were permitted through this period including food pharma etc so like i said there is no one standard answer can i raise a force major contention because the lockdown has happened or because an epidemic is happening again a question asked often is but my clause does use the word epidemic epidemic historically has been confined to an area or a district or a state that's been the historical example of how epidemics are contained in a certain area that area may be locked down therefore the ability to provide goods or services from that area may be adversely affected in the current case the epidemic has further given rise to a host of advisories notifications circulars so look at those carefully they may grant you the ability to claim force major depending specifically on what your contract says but there's no one shoe fits all kind of a remedy over here i've also been asked a question that is there something called a water tight force major clause covering all eventualities well number one you can make it as wide as you want it can be a descriptive clause which helps a lot but a lot of times what judges say when the matter does get tested in the court is was this event something you had contemplated and in fact today we got a little news clip of an acquisition of a company where the lawyer for the selling company has been praised for actually having predicted when the pandemic started that this would not be a ground for the investor or the purchaser to exit from the contract therefore the subsequent events that have happened are currently being viewed as a probability of not being able to exit although of course valuation has fallen etc etc again the notification letter must be in terms of the clause in the contract if it is not the counterparty may well say i'm sorry this does not fulfill the requirements of all that you had to put down in the letter let me give another example it may not apply to your industry but i'll give it give it as an example today malls have been closed there are shops and theaters and restaurants in the malls are they required to pay rent by the same logic i applied earlier as long as your goods are there technically you can be made to pay rent but i have seen a couple of agreements where it actually says 
in the theater situation that if the mall is closed and hence no one can come to my theater, I do not need to pay rent. So I'm just giving examples as to what the situation is. A mere lockdown order in itself, a mere declaration by WHO that there is a pandemic or events of that nature in themselves are not enough. They must be read with the contract. Another question asked is, can I claim a price adjustment or a price reduction because of what is currently happening? Whether it's you or the buyer, can one party to contract claim this? Uh, very unlikely, unless again there's a specific provision. And we have seen certain contracts where it clearly says that if the raw material, typically a key raw material or a key fuel, if the price varies by a certain percentage, that allows me to adjust the price either as a buyer or seller. This typically happens in longer term contracts where there's a main ingredients which is typically of a high cost. It could be a fuel, like I said, it could be a raw material. Can you as a buyer cancel orders because in turn you are unable to sell? That's another question asked. Again, it depends on the contract. Very typically, a seller is going to say, look, you have ordered these goods from me because you are the one who wanted them. I don't really care what you do with them and don't do with them. And again, for example, currently we are faced with a situation where the real estate industry is saying that, look, we cannot construct. Buyers have gone. Therefore, on what basis do I pay my main suppliers of steel and cement, etc.? It's a good question. And again, it depends on the contract. There's no simple answer. I'm going to stop here and hand over to my partner. I've tried to cover the question that was sent to me and give a broad overview. And he'll take it further to specific situations which you may be facing or which may again shed light on some of what you are going through. Thank you. Thank you, Anand. Uh, thank you, uh, Ivama and ASA for giving us this opportunity. Uh, carrying forward from what uh, Anand just mentioned, uh, I think uh, it is extremely related to contractual obligations and force majeure is insurance coverage for disruption of business. And what we are seeing is uh, the two are definitely linked and uh, constantly queries are coming up, which I'm sure each one of you in your respective businesses have insurance coverage for disruption of business. Now, disruption of business, as we all know it, uh, historically has dealt with situations like fire or an earthquake or, you know, the usual force majeure eventualities which is an act of God, which is beyond the reasonable control of either party, which leads to a destruction of property as a result, dis uh, you know, disruption of the business. As a thumb rule principle, uh, what we've been seeing is that uh, insurance policies per se have not contemplated a COVID pandemic kind of a situation leading to a disruption of business directly linked with exactly what Anand was saying is because uh, the disruption is linked with destruction of property, where also the concept of Section 56, which was already discussed in this presentation, comes into play. So what is happening is there are, uh, where it stands today uh, from an insurance standpoint, specifically on this issue, uh, because if there is a contractual obligation to be met, and uh, we are failing to meet such obligations as a result of a disruption because of COVID, uh, can we claim uh, insurance coverage? Uh, the answer where we are today seems unlikely uh, based on a general uh, you know, take on the insurance uh, policies in the market that uh, we usually end up signing up to. However, there are representations that are being made by insurance bodies uh, with the regulator uh, where uh, it has been proposed to consider the COVID uh, pandemic situation as a one-off situation and see if any coverage is uh, at all possible to be given, which will obviously provide certain relief to business owners and operators like yourself. But I, uh, you know, as uh, only time will tell uh, whether that will see the light at the end of the day and also courts uh, i'm sure we are sure that this will go to courts eventually and we'll have to see what the courts interpret uh, 
these matters uh, from an insurance coverage standpoint. The other point I think is also relevant is the rental situation with Anand uh, touched upon. Uh, conceptually, uh, just to add a little bit to what Anand said is uh, from a rental uh, situation standpoint, again, the relevance is the provision of the Transfer of Property Act as well as uh, read with Section 56 of the Contract Act. Uh, so long as the use of the premises is not constrained, it uh, from a technical standpoint, it does not amount to a force majeure situation. And what we are talking about is all thumb rule principles. It would depend on a case to case basis, uh, the theater example that Anand gave, and it could vary uh, from contract to contract. But if we had to look at a trend, if we had to look at what uh, generally is seen in the market from a lease standpoint of view, which is relevant for all of us from our business standpoint, is uh, is there a possibility of a waiver or a, or a right to claim a reduction in a lease rental payout that we are obligated contractually obligated to pay because of a COVID situation so that would again you know while it would depend uh, case to case but technically speaking uh, it is uh, the concepts are again similar to destruction of property and actually becoming impossible uh, to fulfill which means uh, and and so you have to you know if you have to relate to a force measure just think uh, from where this is coming from. For example, an earthquake or a fire. Now, all of these situations clearly result, uh, whether it is insurance or whether it is a rental payment, it is all leading to destruction of the property. So in both that situation, uh, as an example, like an earthquake or a fire, you know, there is a leeway that we have, both from disruption of business perspective, whether it is insurance or lease. But COVID does not necessarily lead to that situation because your physical premises are standing there. Uh, you are in occupation of the premises for all technical purposes. And there is an embargo that we can't access it today, but uh, it is temporary. And, uh, you know, as we are all foreseeing uh, what we heard uh, PM Modi uh, speak last night, and it is anticipated that lockdown 4.0 restrictions would be more relaxed than where we are today, which will be announced uh, prior to the 18th, is what he said. So I think, uh, in a nutshell, uh, carrying forward on these points, uh, primarily insurance as well as the rental aspect, uh, it is it is connected with the terms of the contract. But uh, we've tried to broadly give you a flavor on the uh, general thumb rule uh, principles around these concepts from a business and a contractual obligation and a force majeure standpoint. Anand, would you like to add uh, anything further on, these, uh, on this point? Yeah, so I was just going to run through three cases we've summarized. And also you must keep in mind, when a case is filed in the court, first it comes up for urgent orders or admission and urgent orders, depending which court it's filed in. If it's dismissed there and then with reasons that becomes a judgment of the court. If it's only an ad interim or urgent order, it is what is called a prima facie observation of the court, which may change at the next round of hearings or when the suit is heard. Keeping that in mind, we have just highlighted the way the courts have also interpreted some of these situations where they've been approached. And currently a lot of litigation is going on in the very few cases being heard in the courts because of the situation. So just three, if you can see the slide currently, it's on a Supreme Court order which just came, where it says pretty much what I described a bit earlier. The only thing I would say in the last point, I could have put it a bit better, where the event has been contemplated in force major, section 56 will not apply. If however, the contract has come to an end effectively because it's impossible, it may still apply. You can change the slide, please. The Bombay High Court recently, was approached on the ground that letters of credit which were issued in respect of certain obligation that had to be discharged should not be encashed. Now there also the court held something that may be relevant for questions you may have. Typically a bank guarantee 
or a letter of credit is an independent contract to your main supply or purchase contract. So keep that in mind. And that is what the court has said, that it's a separate contract in this case. They've also gone into force major, but the distinguishing factor is this one, that a letter of credit or a bank guarantee may not have a force major clause. It has to be read unto itself. And unless the conditions exist as per existing law, as to why you cannot be asked to pay, that has to be honored. Can you change the slide, please? Now, Delhi High Court, similarly, has been approached. In that case, they did grant an ad interim injunction on bank guarantee. So I must tell you also that depending on the facts, there have been differing judgments, which is why I put this in. So again, it's not a one standard rule. Bank guarantee means nothing can be done. In this case, the court gave an injunction for a short period, saying that the conditions that were required to grant an injunction did exist. So I, the intent of showing you this is not to confuse you more, because I understand that's a natural consequence of the way orders are being passed. But to demonstrate that every contract, clause, and situation needs to be examined individually and not as a general sweep of the brush. So while the basic principles we discussed just now will apply, you should look at your contracts and understand what remedies you may have, what remedies your buyers may have, what remedies your suppliers may have. Thank you. Good afternoon, it is Murugarandam. Uh, actually, the presenter, are you able to see that uh, question uh, posted on the chat box? I cannot see a question, no. Okay. Uh, see, then what I suggest is that I will read the question. And uh, most of them are related to fourth measure only. Okay, uh, I'll go one by one now. Sure. And you can try, uh, there may be a repetition, please excuse us, because as we are going by the questions, and we try to answer as much as possible. With the present COVID-19 issue, for the, all the POs fallen delivery from March onwards, and uh, after that, shall be exempted from LD class till the end of the year of year for the delivery. Can I repeat the question? Yeah, what I understood was that in view of the lockdown, you cannot supply and are you excused from the LD clause? Is that Was that the question? Yes, please. Again, it will depend on the contract. You may have an ability to say that I am excused from performing, but on the condition, number one, that a force major clause is contained in your contract. Number two, it is attracted. Number three, you have given notice accordingly. Number four, there is adequate ability to interpret the contract in a manner that allows mm -hmm. you to make this claim that LD okay. is not payable. It's possible. It's probable, I would say, but I can't answer the question in the air without seeing the clauses. Okay. Right. So next question is that uh, to meet the expenses of COVID-19, government of India should not tax in any manner, either direct or indirect. Is that a question or a suggestion? It's a question, please. It sounds to me like a suggestion to the government that they should not tax it. Okay, but is there any uh, government order? There's no legal right. There's no, if our question is, is there a legal right to tell the government this? The answer is no. There's no such legal right under our constitution. At least to tell the government okay. you cannot. I understand that. Is there any uh, order or uh, notification from the government in this regard? On tax, no. No. Maybe today Sitaraman will give something. I don't know. Yeah, let's wait for that. Uh, today is. <laughs> I think we, we have done it tomorrow, would have been all the more um, beneficial, but uh, we didn't expect that announcement uh, when we planned this webinar. Okay, moving on to the next. If nothing is specified to terminate the contract in force measure class, till the purchaser can terminate the contract under the provision of Contract Act. 
again the, you know your question are very specific to the terms of a contract you have to read the contract it's difficult to give you a blanket answer like i said yeah but uh, the question itself says that there is nothing specific to determine the contract in the uh, uh, force majeure clause in the contract then you cannot terminate on this ground there may be other grounds will you just if you don't mind just put on aparajit's mic also in case he wants to add something what i'm saying or he wants to answer thank you oh, okay yeah go ahead shall i repeat shall i repeat or uh, move on to the next no, question no, no typically if a contract can be terminated as per the terms of the contract or if there's a remedy the contract act recognizes as a ground for termination okay fine so we are moving to the next question see there are a lot of uh, constraint due to the supply chain so any norms from the government on this aparaj do you want to answer that yeah so uh, thank you anand uh, as of now uh, from a supply chain perspective actually uh, you know part of the relaxation announcements uh, through lockdown 1 2 and 3 and now which we will hear as far as four is concerned uh, supply chain uh, has been moving and uh, actually the government in its notifications the mha notifications under the disaster management act clearly say that supply chain uh, goods are freely allowed to move across the borders uh, with the relevant passes and uh, initially of course it was restricted only to essential uh, goods uh, being manufactured but subsequently uh, post the relax last round of relaxations uh, you know uh, it's been allowed even for non essentials where you are allowed to uh, recommence manufacturing depending on whether you are in an urban location or a, a rural location and uh, a percentage of the workforce so to answer your question apart from that Uh, there has been no directive from the government on uh, supply chain per se reaching the manufacturing facility or or going out yeah i mean understand your point but on ground reality the both the things didn't happen first of all though the non essential goods are also allowed to move but in practically it didn't happen because the lack of uh, transporters or uh, drivers available second right. even uh, even the goods could not be manufactured in this uh, supply chain uh, companies because as such there was no uh, laborers or they are not working so in ground reality is that uh, most of the non essential goods it was not manufactured in the during lockdown period at least in supply chains right so uh, in that process so the disaster management act as well as the mha notifications actually uh, ground reality i i uh, we do appreciate what you're saying uh, but uh, from a legal perspective if we have to respond you know that's the that's the uh, relaxation that the government has provided the government has also gone a step further and said that where you're facing issues you can actually uh, approach the local dm as well as the local authorities under the disaster management act who been appointed and uh, raise the concerns so for example uh, some clients of ours who are in the waluj district of aurangabad uh, have been facing similar issues on supply chain do acknowledge what you're saying uh, it's a practical reality they have also been facing issues about uh, workers because uh, in a particular industry you know there are skilled and semi skilled and different kinds of workers which are required and for their movement also uh, just on that particular example movement from aurangabad to waluj has not been possible because the local district magistrate has actually said that while uh, you know the mha allows this as we all know uh, what the mha has also said is that the local authorities can actually make it even more stricter to contain the spread of covid so what they have done uh, they have said that you cannot uh, you know bring them from beyond uh, 10 km radius now that has posed a huge challenge uh, for uh, for our clients in that district as an example in maharashtra so what we have advised and what we are doing and perhaps uh, again no thumb rule principle but it's a practical approach uh, in that sense is 
they have all approached uh, the uh, DM's office as well as the police authorities uh, filing uh, exemption waiver applications at least for a one time movement. And uh, so all that I'm saying is uh, while the law and the fine print is very clear, as you rightly said, uh, we've all read it. But from a practical perspective, if we need any form of a relief from a government, the relevant authority is the district magistrate of that district where your factory manufacturing facility is located to be approached on these issues. Okay, thank you very much. So we moving on to the next question. We agree that the Fort Majeur is a contractual town, but does it contradict the principle of natural justice? Anand, would you like to take that? Yeah, there is there's no principle of natural justice in terms of a contractual term. Natural justice typically is the process by which a matter is heard by a court, meaning you are given a fair notice, you're given a fair hearing, things like that. One thing I do want to say, and I, I'm not sure it was mentioned earlier, I don't think I heard it. In terms, I think I did hear that a lot of your members supply to the government. Now the government, by an office memorandum of 19th February 2020, it's on the net, you can find it. The Department of Expenditure, Procurement Policy, Ministry of Finance has said in principle that force major will apply in principle to situations subject, of course, to reading the contract. So that is something you may want to read when you read your contracts if you are dealing with government as a supplier. Right. Moving on to that, this might be again, I can see it is a repeat, but for more clarity, if we can answer it again, it will be quite nice. If the pandemic is not exclusively listed in the contract class, how does it this play out for both parties? Is we, for example, a customer want to cancel an order, can they do this if the epidemic is not listed in the contract two class under port measure? Typically, no. It depends again. If it's, let's take an example. If you are contracting to buy a perishable good, which I doubt will be the case in your industry, but I'm just saying oh, it may. Good. Yeah, exactly. But in that, because then, if I can't, you know, deliver at a certain time, it goes bad. As an example, mm -hmm. that may not mm -hmm. apply to you, like I said. Okay. Right. This again on. Uh, how to formulate a watertight uh, force module class covering all unforeseen eventualities <laughs> for the future? I'd actually address this when I gave my little speech. In principle, the intent of the parties and what the parties were contemplating is what a judge is going to look at, even if you have an inclusive clause. So even if you say all acts of God, all acts that are beyond my control, all acts of government, all acts of third parties beyond my control, including one, two, three, four. That's about mm -hmm. as wide as you can make it. Okay. Even then, it's quite possible a judge is going to say, look, at the time when you entered this contract, on what basis are you suggesting that you could have foreseen this? He could say that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so next question is that, uh, how is that uh, force measure is invoked? By a simple notification letter or a litigation on the, in which form? It'll be by a notice depending on the terms of the agreement. Typically, every force major clause has a notice requirement. Okay. We move on to the next. How does the force major become effective and under whose declaration it can be invoked? The affected party in terms of the contract by notice. So in case of COVID, uh, does it uh, World Health Organization declaration of a pandemic uh, constitutes a force majeure? Valid worldwide or should individual countries declare the need for force majeure? Force majeure is a creature of contract. It's not a declaration by government or by anyone else. Okay. So it's again in between parties. Yes. As per the contract. Yes. Actually, there's a government notification declaring that uh, the um, COVID-19 pandemic as a force measure. Is it valid here? 
Apalaji, do you want to answer that? Yes, uh, yes, Anand. That's a that's a good point. Uh, so what uh, you're absolutely correct. Uh, the government has circulated the notification internally as well as some internal memos on project on uh, government contracts. And they have taken a position that uh, for government contracts, uh, the COVID uh, situation is a uh, force majeure situation. Having said that, uh, that only creates a benchmark. It cannot be interpreted to apply to private uh, contracts or you know uh, relationships between two private parties. Uh, but uh, that can that is definitely a reference point. Having said that, uh, you know Anand has already deliberated and explained the concept of force majeure uh, and how it could vary from contract to contract and from term to term and the relevance of Section 56 where it stems from. You know in that sense but uh, you know as a thumb rule there's no thumb rule principle to say to answer your question that uh, force majeure automatically includes a pandemic or a covid 19 situation then there is no such principle and uh, government is uh, taking a position uh, as far as government contracts are concerned okay, fine Moving on to the next question what will be the treatment of cost incurred when force majeure has been enforced. I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Okay, I'll repeat. What will be the treatment of cost incurred when the force measure has been enforced or invoked? So I think it's uh, Anand that's talking about the legal cost, uh, the litigation cost, perhaps. Uh, I think more than that, it might could be the um, the raw material already procured. Which could not be supplied, which could be significant uh, value of the contract. That again depends on what your contract says, because, like I said, a financial adverse effect or a financial unviability also is not considered to be adequate to exit from a contract or not perform a contract. Okay, moving on to the next. If a buyer cancels an order mentioning force measure, is it possible for the seller to claim cancellation charges? Yes, if the contract does not have such a provision, he can. So another is that a MSME Act to 2006 requires payment within 45 days. However, there is no relaxation given by the government. How this will be dealt during COVID-19? So my, my understanding, please again, please add to it. But my understanding is that in several sectors, government has relaxed time frames. Himanshu covered some of them from a company compliance filing point of view. There are situations, in fact, one of my colleagues was just discussing with me, even registration act under which, as you know, you have to register a document for purchase of property, et cetera, et cetera, in four months. There is no relaxation. So what you are describing also, there's currently possibly no relaxation. I've not checked, but so the government will have to come up with something. So for example, as you know, Supreme Court has passed a judgment saying that limitation in all cases of filings, which would otherwise get time barred, has been relaxed. But this is really not a broad brush, but an item by item kind of a situation depending on the circumstances. Okay, right. So uh, this, uh, with this, uh, I'm coming to the end of the question I received through the chat box here. Okay, and I'm sure you already answered it. Uh, the two uh, questionnaire we already sent to you. Okay. So yeah, that, I answered. Uh, yeah. With that, the question and answer session comes to an end. Thank you. I'm sorry, we could not the only specific nature of the the nature of the questions, which is rightly so, and the nature of the law on this is very contract specific. I understand that now. I think everybody has realized that. But uh, the unfortunate thing is that uh, nobody would have foreseen this uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. I know. So they would not have uh, coined the wording. Uh, Right. Of this, there's a big question now. How to overcome that? Uh, having not the contract time when it was uh, formed, uh, COVID, nobody has uh, imagined such a thing will happen. 
True. Okay. So how to yes. overcome this now? Because at the most of them will be the seller will be affected party. True. That's it. Uh, which we are the manufacturers are the affected party. So we are all the more uh, on the uh, some way out of this. Okay. No, no. I, I think uh, if I may just come in, this Arvind Goel, uh, it could be seen that the force measure will not allow a buyer to cancel the order, and if the uh, seller wants to enforce this he, the seller can enforce that so that to that extent it helps our industry okay great um, so this is uh, pranay here pranay garg so i think that was a very uh, interesting um, session uh, thanks a lot to himanshu shrivastu from asa and associates to throw light on the company law compliances where yes there has been some uh, relief from the government to help us, uh, you know, take forward and maintain the compliance, which is there. And then thanks Anand and Aprajit from DSK to throw light on the force majeure clause and uh, how the contracts are to be managed. It is interesting as we can see that, you know, the force majeure clause has always been there in the contracts, but yes, in the last two months it has been read um, so many times, which perhaps has never been read in the whole uh, lifetime of the contract acts and uh, but yes one thing one important takeaway is that yes the force majeure clause has to be seen in light of what is specifically written in the contract there are aspects as we understand which can be different from contract to contract within the force majeure clause so that is something which is a task for us as an industry to review at our end Another important takeaway I see here is that uh, force majeure is not applicable by default to the Indian uh, contracts and the Indian Contracts Act is to be referred clause 56. So again, uh, the contract in case of Indian transactions has to be seen in that light. And uh, yes, nobody anticipated such things. So um, I am sure the force majeure clauses are going to be redrafted as all of us go ahead into the new normal which is so i with that i think i'll um, thank everybody for their participant participation thank you to the panelists and to kim to organize it uh, to support us and all the attendees where we got participation in large numbers and um, after we saw the relaxation on the company law let's hope there is some more um, care which is going to be given to us by the government in what um, Ms. Nirmala Sitaraman has to say, uh, perhaps coming online anytime. So with that, I think um, we are ready to um, close the session. Um, and uh, Kim, is there um, anything you want to add or we can end the session now? Uh, hi, no, I think we're good. Um, let's end the session right now. We will be sending a recording of this to um, all of the participants today. And uh, okay. as always, the speakers remain at your disposal if you have any questions that you would like answered after this webinar as well. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Okay. Bye.